that I'm, I'm pleased to have the uh, opportunity to be with you tonight. And uh, my, my expertise really is in trees um, and more from the scientific side of things. Uh, and some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about tonight, uh, I, I got into almost by default um, in, in the sense that it's not really the science, um, but more about the economics. And I fell into that really because no one else was doing that sort of thing 10 years ago um, in Australia and, and someone had to do it so I sort of started to kick off. And I'd like to give a, a brief context. Um, you all recognise this pro probably as part of Gippsland. Uh, it's, it's close to the sort of temperate, uh, cool temperate rainforest that you're going to get in Victoria, isn't it? On the verge, um, some uh, native beach and a whole lot of uh, Mount Nash and all that sort of stuff. And in less than a, a century, um, we basically turned it into that. Now, I, I do this not to make anyone feel guilty, by the way. This is just to remind people that things can happen very, very fast and that when things, an ecosystem, start to change, uh, we like to think that we might be in control, but often we're not. Um, you, you start off with one intention and before you know it, other things have happened. Um, this is quite a famous uh, stump. Uh, a lot of people would, have, uh, would know it. it. It's not far from Bairnsdale. And uh, I use it for a whole range of reasons. Close to the south. Close to the fair enough. And uh, I use it to sort of talk about the, the, the form of the root system, the fact that it's on the bank of the river, it was mined, it's been cleared. Um, the soil level has dropped about uh, uh, one and a half to not quite two metres. Uh, I also talk about uh, the form of the root system, but I'm going to talk about that tonight. And I also show this slide quite often. And many of you will have seen this slide before, and it probably doesn't come as a, as a, a wake-up call to you, but you would be surprised, in fact, you might be amazed how many Victorians that I speak to who didn't know that Victoria, Victoria was essentially a wooded state. Now, it wasn't all forest. The black area in 1887 wasn't necessarily forest, but it was vegetation that had a woody dominant species. So it might have been an open woodland or a forest and the like. And you can see the grassland areas in that 1887 map compared to the 1987 map. And I'm very interested in the grasslands too with another um, uh, hat on. The interesting thing about this map, I think, I, I often get asked a couple of questions. First is, well, how much of the wooded vegetation have we cleared in Victoria? And the answer is about two thirds, about two thirds. And the next question that I'm normally asked is, well, that, that mapping wouldn't be as accurate as this mapping because 100 years ago they, did, they weren't that accurate at mapping things. Well, let me remind you that in 1887, that map was astonishingly accurate. The foresters knew where every piece of wood was because it was effectively the oil of their day. It had major economic, um, social uh, and trade implications. And so this map was created using the same modelling and algorithms as the other. And as I say, it does come as a shock to Victorians who generally think of ourselves as environmentally friendly, pretty green state. You know, we're not like those villains over in Western Australia that are sort of carving everything up. And we're certainly not like the villains up in Queensland. Well, maybe we were. It just happened before living memory and we got away with it then and we're paying for it to some extent now. Um, I thought you might be interested in this table. Uh, and I'm, I want you to just focus on this. There's quite a bit of data in this. Now, there's a little bit of story behind this. Um, I was asked to, to write a little article for a, 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 a trade magazine in the States on climate change and, and what it might mean for arborists and professional practice. And, and it means a great deal, by the way, in terms of tree selection and how trees might respond. And also, um, my approach was that many of the trees that we use in arboriculture are really quite resilient. And so don't panic, you know, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Remember the, the guide, first line, don't panic. Um, and, and so, but I do, you ask yourself, why was I asked to do this? Why did they ask an Aussie to do something like this? Why didn't the Yank do it? And some of you would work out why. It's so contentious in the States that I figured they asked a dumb Aussie who was, you know, 15,000 kilometres away, and if something happened to him, well, that was just his bad luck. 
And I had to take a, a global perspective. I wasn't allowed to be focused simply on Australia. So Australasia is basically us in New Zealand. And what I wanted to show you is that if you look at the temperature changes, uh, in, Australia, in Australasia, we're talking a, a, a sort of a, a change maybe of four degrees. And that's really problematic. Those of you that, that are sort of interested in, in why uh, a few degrees um, extra temperature in the atmosphere is important, what you forget is the globe is a very big place and a rise of temperature of one degree means there's a heck of a lot more energy in the global system. And how does that energy manifest itself in changed wind speeds, storms, hurricanes and the like? But I wanted to show you what's going to happen or what is likely to happen in North America. A seven degree change. And in parts of Europe, an eight degree change. Now, the, the message I want to give here is that if you look at Victoria under the climate change models and so on, um, the, the world may well change, but it's not catastrophic. Okay, if there is 10% less rain, that's really serious stuff, but it's not enough to turn us into a desert. It's not enough for you to go running around in circles outside saying the world is going to end and the sky is going to fall. And if the temperature goes up by a degree or two, it again will make a difference, but it's not catastrophic. This sort of stuff, if you were looking at that, then the word catastrophic might come up, but it doesn't come up to where we are. And the other thing, I, and, and as a consequence, I want people to understand that, okay, even if things do change, then there's something we can do about it. Because what I find really quite disconcerting is when they talk about global climate change, the normal reaction is, well, it's someone else's problem. <coughs> Australia's, you know, not that big, we don't produce that much carbon, we don't produce that much methane, look at those blighters in China or America or in, in India and so on. And then the other reaction is, well, what can we do about it? And the truth is that it's people like you, and I hope like me to some extent, that can actually do something about it. Because what we do on a citywide, regional, or statewide basis can make a difference to the temperatures that we're going to experience. It's going to make a difference to the evaporation rates. And if we do things properly, what we do as a town, city or region could basically make us almost immune to what happens in the, on, at, a, at a global level. And that's going to be one of the themes that I'm going to pursue in the next little while. Uh, the other thing I thought I would show you, this, these two little charts are some of the things that might happen. Now, I, I want to point out to you that I went through my archives to find this, not just for this talk, but about a year ago. I first started talking to students at Burnley about the potential for climate change and their involvement as professionals back in 1988, okay, which is a long time ago. And we were looking at some of the predictions that were made between 1988 and about 1990 in terms of what might the implications be. No one was sure. So we talked about warmer winters, and you all know that. We talked about more easterly winds. We talked about more extreme fire days. We talked about places that didn't have a fire, a bushfire history, having a, a bushfires and change weather patterns and so on. And I simply want to remind you that a number of these sort of uh, predictions have very profound implications. And some of them, not all of them, but some of them are already having practical implications. So, for example, when I prepared this table and we talked about the number of days above 30 or 35 degrees C, the implication was that there would be more air conditioners used in towns and cities. Now, when we wrote that, I didn't know anyone that really had an air conditioner. You could go down the street, and yes, that, that house has got one sticking out the window. You might go 10 houses, and now, in many cities and towns, you can go down a street and every house has an air conditioner. And what happens is, you have two or three days above 35 degrees C, and what's the Aussie attitude? Yeah, it'll end tomorrow, it'll be right the next day. But you go to a place like Melbourne, 
and you say you're going to get 10 or 12 of those days and they start thinking about air conditioners and then they start thinking about what drives the air conditioner, the electricity and so on. There's a whole range of implications to these sorts of predictions and none of these predictions were intended to scaremonger. The, the predictions were meant to say these are some of the things that might happen if you've got 20 years warning you can plan for it. You're not going to be ambushed. Okay? And that has, I think, really quite profound implications. <coughs> now, um, I, I'm assuming that some of you uh, have a sense of humour. Uh, and uh, you might think I have too by the end of the night, although you may not. And uh, I found this photograph on the front of the Herald Sun. Do you remember it? And, and this, is, this is on the, 40, the week just leading up to the 40... Uh, six degree uh, day uh, of Black Saturday. And this gentleman here with his hose is cooling down the tracks. Now I get some great questions about this. Someone asked me were the tracks melting? Um, <laughs> no they weren't melting uh, but what happens is of course they expanded and buckled. And so I thought this is interesting because just a few hundred metres away there is another piece of track where there was no buckling, no damage done. And the question is, why is it so? And the answer is, these trees just provide sufficient shade in the morning and in the afternoon that there is no buckling. Now, if you think about it, those trees are providing a service. They're providing a service. And in our economy, the economists say, as soon as something has a, a function, or provides a service, it has value, and they mean economic value. So I thought to myself, I can now say that these trees, okay, have at least the value of this man's salary. Because you don't have to pay anyone to cool down. And of course, you all know that this is top quality Melbourne potable water, don't you? <laughs> and you can work out the value of that. And so you can then work out how many days this is likely to happen. And then you can start to say, well, these trees growing along this part of the railway line, they provide that particular service. It has an economic value. And the consequences of that are, well, if you don't like the look of them and you object to the fact that they drop leaves in autumn and you have to send a street sweeper along twice and it costs you $300 per 100 metres or whatever it is, you can then offset that cost against the benefit. And you start to treat those trees as an asset, not as a bloody nuisance. You see? And I, I find it somewhat sort of useful to think of trees as assets as opposed to bloody nuisances. Now, I'm going to pursue this all the way through. And I'm also going to remind you that if you want to look at it in this more seriously, um, Barry Brooks, who's the Professor of Climate Change uh, over in uh, South Australia, uh, he's not a fan of the IPCC, by the way, and so that, which is the International Climate Panel. You might find it refreshing to read someone who says, well, this is what we've, the, the data tells us and I've got nothing to do with those other snoozers that are writing the reports. Um, but there are a whole range of things, and you might... I'm happy to provide a, a copy of this overhead and you might look at these over the next few years and say well that one didn't happen and that one did and, and so on. So you can keep a bit of a tabs on it. And the other thing I wanted to say up here is land use management is a really complex issue isn't it? Um, it? It's not simple and in many ways the sort of stuff that I do in the city is much simpler than you have to confront up here because the land use options are pretty much determined and made for us in cities, whereas you folks that are out on the land in particular, you have a whole lot of things that you might do, a whole lot of considerations to think about. You know, your, the intended use, the, the ecology of the area, your productivity, the history, what you've done in the past, a whole range of things. And I was very impressed that many of these aspects are covered in the document that's sitting on your seat. The fact that you've been out talking to people about what's happened in the past and what you want in the future. On average, um, and I think my, my wife can confirm this, she may not be happy to do so later, but I do about somewhere between 30 and 50 public, free public talks a year, okay, which you work it out, it's almost one a week. And um, so I get around the state uh, and, and I get to talk to a lot of people. 
And I'm very interested that most people are interested in what I've got to say about trees. Haven't met anyone that sort of got up and said, oh, it's a load of rubbish and I hate trees, get rid of the lot. Okay, which is very lucky. But then I'm pre preaching to the converted. Um, I do get a lot of, at the end of the talks, I love trees, but, and the buts are beauty, and I'll talk about a few of those buts in a second. Um, but in terms of re-veg, there's a whole lot of reasons why you might want to consider revegetation as, as part of your philosophies. And these are some of the reasons that, that were given to us. I, I ran a number of workshops and we actually surveyed, why do you do it? Why do you do it? And you know, mostly it's about appearances, concern for the environment, provision of wildlife habitat. And you might be interested to know that when I use this, and I don't use it all that often in, in the city, but I do use it from time to time, people go, oh yes, yes, we all agree with that. And so they say, well, what do people in the bush say? What, what, what sort of responses do you get from them? And the, the answer is exactly the same. Exactly the same. And the other thing that surprises a lot of people is that when you actually put percentages against the numbers, whether you live in the inner city or you live up in Horsham or Dookie or Shepparton, the percentages of responses, if the group's big enough, that is over 30 odd, are within 1%. And I find it fascinating. When, when I, I did a course in the States a, a number of years ago, and one of the things that astonished me in the States was that under their system of administration, there is an advantage in distinguishing yourself as a minority group and being different from everybody else. So what does that do? You tend to focus on your differences rather than your similarities, okay? And what I found when we did these surveys is there virtually aren't any differences between an urban thinking person and a rural person who are attending those sorts of sessions. And I think that's really quite instructive. Now, I'm going to move on because I'm going to run out of time otherwise. And I've been told I've got 45 minutes and I'll take 44 of them, um, but I will finish on time to the relief of everyone. So a few years ago, this is the question that I want people to ask. I want you to look at that, and you all recognise that as Melbourne, right? And I want to know what functions does that parkland and the vegetation on it perform? What value does it provide? In other words, I don't want people just to see it and say, isn't that pretty? Because if you think about it, we used to call the sort of horticulture that I'm involved with ornamental horticulture. Have you heard that phrase? Ornament. Hate it. Absolutely hate it. Why? Because ornaments are optional. They're decoration. Not from my perspective. This parkland is functional and essential urban infrastructure. Now, in our society, if you want to prove that something is important, the simplest way of doing it is to put a dollar value on it. How many dollars does it save? So, I'll give you an example. I want to know what's the value of the shade. How much cooling is there for the buildings that surround it, provided by that parkland? We know that the urban heat island effect and you don't have to have a really large city to have a heat island effect, okay? You can get it in a few blocks in a, in a regional town. But it, when you've got a city like Melbourne or Sydney, the urban heat island effect can be massive. And it usually raises the temperature somewhere around five degrees C, okay? Five degrees C. Well, all of this green space keeps the temperature down and the shade keeps the temperature down. What does that do? It means these buildings don't run their air conditioners for quite so long or quite so high. And that means there's a significant saving of electricity. In Victoria, and in Melbourne in particular, where does our electricity come from? Essentially brown coal, okay? So if you can say this vegetation saves on the use of air conditioning and on electricity, it's also going to save on the pollution of CO2 that use of brown coal generates. So it's, it's sort of an ongoing thing. Next question I want to know. I want to know if we have unseasonal, unseasonably heavy rainfall, how much of this rainfall is soaked up by this parkland rather than getting to the drains? 
Now, you may say, well, that probably doesn't matter because the drones are there. Well, just, just tell you one other thing. Most of the engineers that are responsible for the drainage systems in our major cities and towns in this state have already looked at what would happen if instead of having the sort of rainfall that Victoria has had in the past, we went to 10% less rainfall, but more summer rainfall in heavier showers, which is one of the predictions. And that's, of course, a bit like Sydney, isn't it? OK, can you think of that? Sydney climate in Victoria. It's awful. Anyway, the point here is if that would happen, in a place like Melbourne, Geelong, Ballarat or Bendigo, the drain pipes are not big enough and you would get local flooding. So the engineers did what engineers do and what they're really good at. They said, well, if you're going to have more rainfall, what do you need? Bigger pipes. Bigger pipes. And so a tentative costing was done to retrofit bigger pipes. Not going to happen. We don't have the wealth. We are not wealthy enough to retrofit bigger pipes. So the engineers said, well, what can we do? And they made an astounding discovery. Did you know, you probably didn't know this, that plants take up water? Okay, they did that. And the other thing that they discovered was that even if they don't take up water through their roots, they hold the water, some of it, in their canopy and they drop it over a longer period of time. Okay, now, this is a dilemma. Because if you think about it, the mission of council and city engineers since the 70s has, to be, has been to make sure that no water that falls in their area ever gets to the roots of any of their plants because they've put in concrete curb and channel and bitumen roads. Do you remember? Now, are you aware of the fact that there are serious, and I mean really serious, engineering projects, and I'm sure there would be some done in this uh, catchment area, that are now looking at ways of diverting the water in one of these storms to irrigate the trees. Okay? And one of my PhD students did the only study in the world that we're aware of looking at street trees and what street tree roots do with stormwater runoff. No one has done it with trees. Lots of people have done it with grasses and sedges and the little things, right? She did it with trees. Now, it won't come as a surprise to anyone in this, in this room that if you take the polluted stormwater, and what's it polluted with? It's polluted with essentially nitrogen and phosphorus, okay? Essentially. And you run it through the tree root systems that we've designed, the trees get a fertiliser boost. And so they establish better and quicker and the water that comes out of the bottom is much cleaner, so when it goes into the aquifers, you don't have to treat it. This is one of those rare, rare win, 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 win situations, okay? But you've got to remember, there are whole suburbs in Australian cities where the curb and channel and the paved road are basically directing all of the water into the drains. This is going to be a big change in thinking, and it's already happening. So you get some of the ideas here. Um, in other parts of the world, we know about the reductions of wind speed. Now, just as a matter of interest, I was talking to a forester just recently, and we've had a lot of windstorms, haven't we? And we're probably going to have more of them, stronger wind. And how often have you heard, oh, bloody wind blew the branch off that tree and it, it did this? Okay. Now, in, a, in Sydney, they had a very big windstorm. I think it was in about 1990. And all of the papers focused on the damage that was done by falling branches and falling trees. Okay. And the forester said, you know, not one person said that in other places the trees had, had stopped the roofs from being lifted by filtering the winds. So in other words, we did what we always do with vegetation. We look at the negative... You look at the, oh, five trees fell down and they did damage. What about the 10,000 in the same area that didn't fall, that protected the roofs, that made sure all those houses remained intact? Well, we don't count them. And, of course, the insurance companies, five trees. In, in New South Wales, they genuinely came out three years ago saying, too many people are dying running into trees. Solution? We'll get rid of the trees. This is in cars, right? Now, one of my colleagues 
who works at the University of Western Sydney, she said to them, well, okay, how many people died from cars running into power poles and utility poles? And it was something like seven times more. So the logic of that would be, leave the trees and get rid of the power poles first. Okay, didn't happen obviously, but isn't it a strange way of looking at the world? Um, in the uh, Los Angeles basin, back in uh, the uh, early part and late, later part of the last century, early part of this one, they're planting 11 million trees. Now that's a massive deal. And I would imagine that a number of you in this room are saying, gee, that's pretty enlightened. I wonder what environmental group got that project going. And the answer is none. It's not a Greenies project, it's an economist project. They worked out that if they planted these 11 million trees, they get 50 million bucks of savings per year in reduced air conditioning. They also said there would be cooling of 35 million and so on. And they worked out that over 20 years, their return, they would get $211 value for a roughly $30 they spent. In other words, they were looking at a return of six to one. The economics drove that project, not the green uh, sort of environmental movement. Now, in general, when you do these sorts of analyses, the return that on your investment for trees tends to be somewhere between six and about 12 to one, okay? And there have been some Australian studies done. The, the best one, by the way, if you go to treenet.com, there's a conference proceedings there, 14 of them, you can read them. We did a study in Adelaide that said you got roughly $200 of value per year from a, a typical Adelaide street tree. Now, what was a typical Adelaide street tree? It could be a plane tree, it could be a eucalypt, essentially the same, okay? $200 of value. Do you know how much they spend per tree on a street tree in Adelaide? Less than 20 bucks a year. So you're getting $200 of value for 20 bucks per year. If I said to you, I'm going to give you 10 times what you uh, give me in a year's time, there'd be a queue all the way from that door to Melbourne. It's a phenomenal return. And this is found consistently, consistently in studies around the world. The environmental values are really important. I'm not going to go through them all. But just to give you an idea, this is for you as individuals. The trees in your garden, they can cool your house by eight degree. They can reduce the water runoff from your property. They can reduce storm wind <laughs> speeds. They can certainly offset carbon emissions. In many places, removing pollutants. You might say pollutants are not a problem in, in Australia. You go to Melbourne when there's an inversion, you go to Sydney, okay? We're just sheer lucky that our cities are large, spread out over large areas, relatively small populations, globally speaking, and we're coastal. So luckily most of the pollution gets washed away or blown away. Stabilised land on steep blocks, I'll talk about that. Of course, increased biodiversity. And then there are the human health and sociological benefits that I'm going to mention briefly before I finish. Now, numbers, okay? And I worked on 100,000 trees. Why 100,000 trees? If you go to the inner city of Melbourne, there's about 100,000 mature trees. 65,000 owned by the Melbourne City Council, 35 in front and back yards. If you go to uh, Burundara or you go up to Ballarat or Bendigo, the tree populations are roughly 100,000. So there's a sensible reason for doing it. And also, I can divide by 100,000 really easily. <laughs> I can almost do it in the head. Now, I, I don't want to go through all of this, but very quickly, if you've got 100,000 trees, the savings in electricity will be about 30 kilowatt uh, per annum per tree, which means you'll save about um, $500,000. Now, that's just from the shade. If you consider that in Victoria, for every kilowatt hour of electricity we generate from brown coal, you use roughly 100 litres of potable water okay, in the process. And then that water is just run through once it's warmed up. Now, the value of that water is about 450,000. So 100,000 trees save you about a million bucks per annum 
just in terms of electricity and water. Now, if you think about something like an elm, how long does it grow for? 130, 140, 150 years, you start doing the sums. They're really very valuable. Eucalypts, mm, depending on which one, river red gum planted in the right place, done properly, you might get 600 years out of it. You might. So these numbers start to become very, very impressive. If you look at the carbon sequestered in 100,000 trees, uh, it's worth about 30 million about $30 million. That's using, by the way, up front here, the $23 per tonne that we're currently using under the previous government scheme. Okay, that's putting the value on carbon. Um, next week it might be a quarter of that or one-fifth of that. Um, but you can, you can work out there's still a lot of carbon. And even if you use the value of the euro today, about eight to $10 per tonne, still a lot of money. And how many balance sheets have that on it? None. Absolutely none. So a lot of carbon sequestered as you can see. And I'll talk about that again. And if you're looking at carbon, and, and by the way, if anyone wants to know how we worked out there's about 10 tonnes per tree, ask me at the end and I'll tell you because it's quite interesting. Uh, it might be boring, but I'll, it's interesting. Um, what about la line clearing? Line clearing. Now, how many of you remember Monty Python? The comedy show, okay. So, so, this is funny. I mean, this is really funny, I reckon. So, if you prune 100 mature trees, you're pruning off, if you take off 30%, and that's a very conservative figure, you're taking off about $4,500 worth of carbon. Agreed? Now, here's the rub. I find this absolutely fascinating. Who are the biggest carbon polluters in the state? Oh, it's the energy generators, the power generators, the electricity generators. And so they should be interested in sequestering their carbon. And who comes along and chops all this carbon off street trees? The yeah, power can. Does that make sense to you? Can you imagine John Cleese getting that? He'd be goose-stepping all over them. Okay? And, and if you go one step further, have you ever asked a council whether they could underground the cable? Uh, not a council, the power company, they'll tell you it costs too much money. Well, the installation cost is high, but who does the pruning? Not them, the council. Okay? And if you started to value the carbon properly as it's really worth, within two pruning cycles, three at most, you would be thousands in front if you put the cables underground. And before anyone in this room says, but they'd cut through all the root systems, you all know that they tunnel under the trees now, don't you? The boring equipment is so sophisticated, you don't do any root damage straight under the trees. So, we're all being sold a pup on that particular line. And the other thing, um, if you want to put a real economic spin on this, okay, this is what they'll do to you. They'll say, we'll put the cables underground, but you've got to make up the difference. And I was at a conference between some of the power companies when they made that offer to the locals. And the locals, the residents and the council thought that was reasonable. Okay, and it's been done in some places. My question was, could you explain to me the economics of the following? You have an obsolete above ground electricity uh, supply system and you're requesting that a state of the art system underground at no expense to you be paid for by the local residents and the council. Can you explain the logic of that? And they left the meeting. <laughs> they got up and that was the end of it. They never came back. In other words, if you look at the economics of this, we are being dudded big time in terms of this particular aspect, not just from an environmental perspective, but from an economic one as well. Remember, most of the benefits that I've been talking about so far have been above ground, but never forget the root systems. We don't exactly know how much carbon is fixed below the ground. All of the algorithms essentially say there's about as much carbon fixed in a tree below ground as above ground. But the evidence is quite the contrary. Because of all the fungal growth and all of the microorganisms, the mycorrhizal fungi in particular, that are associated with tree root systems, the general assumption is that there is an underestimate between a factor of two and five times 
for the amount of carbon associated with the root system. And prior to talking to you tonight, tonight, we were talking about some of our eucalypt species, <coughs> lignotuberous lig uh, root systems, absolute marvellous asset. And how often do you see a tree, slightly poor in form, come in, chop it down, grind out the root and start again? If you've got a lignotuber, you can get a really good tree in a fraction of the time. But the mentality says, once the canopy looks ratty, oh, we don't worry about what happens below the ground. Unacceptable. Unacceptable. Uh, just so you can see a few root systems, that's an elm root system, by the way. Very close to the surface, very shallow in spreading, pretty easy to manage. Eucalypt root system, on the other hand, way out all over the place, very difficult to manage and predict. Now, a few other little sort of examples of economic value. Um, if you've got shade on a tree-lined street, and here I've talked about a street of about um, uh, half a kilometre in length, 500 metres, 100 trees along the, tree, uh, the street, and you'll notice that the bitumen uh, has to be placed at a certain period of time. Now, there is very, very good evidence that if you shade a bitumen road or uh, car park or uh, schoolyard, you prolong the life of that bitumen because bitumen is a super cool liquid like glass. It has a solvent in it and in the hot Australian sun the solvent evaporates, the surface goes crumbly, you have to relay it. Okay? Now, just on these sums, you save about 1.6 million if you've got a completely shaded tree lined street. It's a massive saving. Now the interesting thing about this is every council that I've talked to, to can tell you how much root damage has been done to a road or a footpath and what it costs per square metre to replace. Mm -hmm. And not one of them has ever gone out and said, well, that street, you know, we've only replaced the bitumen in that street once in the last 60 years. And why have they done it? Because it's completely shaded. If you get a mottled effect, you don't do any saving, obviously, because if an area degrades and another doesn't, they're going to do the whole road anyway. So you've got to have a very nice tree-lined street. But there are lots of them in our major regional towns. You know, you can think of them in um, Ballarat and Bendigo. Uh, you'd have some here. Uh, you can think of several in the suburbs of Melbourne. Many in the suburbs of Melbourne. And this is another one that uh, I don't think anyone's uh, talked about. And you don't need to worry about this amortisation column. That was me getting very sort of economics one and two about things. Um, but after the Black Saturday fires, uh, there were a, a number of properties that uh, the owner's reaction was, right, house is gone, got to rebuild, came in, cleared all the trees, and they ground out all the stumps. And I don't know whether you heard this on the radio, because it was an issue. They got permission to rebuild, but couldn't get insurance, couldn't get building insurance, because the insurance company said, without the trees, the land is now unstable. You could get a landslip. Your block's too steep. The piling solution for five trees on a block costs about 50000 So those trees were providing $1,000 per annum of value per tree to that owner. Pretty amazing stuff, isn't it? And that, that particular owner had two options. He could plant and he could wait somewhere between 10 and 20 years and then he could rebuild because the trees would be big enough to stabilise the block. Or he could go in for piling and engineering solution, which of course they did, at an extra 50000 um, Some of you may have heard about this. Uh, again, after Black Saturday, uh, there was a bit of a panic in the then state government. And Black Saturday, as you know, was in February. In the September-October holidays that followed, Permission was given to remove any tree that was in, within 30 metres of a classroom in a school ground. So they removed trees that were in the middle of bitumen, never going to burn. I uh, saw others that were next to uh, grass turfed, manicured um, playing fields, never going to burn, but they went. Now, of course, what happened? The money was made available for the removal. And then about November, the sun came out and everyone said, oh, geez. We don't have any shade. Solution's easy. We'll get some shade sales. Shade sales are quite expensive. And I know one tree 
that was replaced by four shade sales, which means it was providing $20,000 of value, or roughly $2,000 per year of value, because the shade sales last about a decade before they have to be replaced. Four of them. And of course, you know that the, there's a situation here. No budget for the purchase of the shade sales. Parents had to raise the money. Now you might say, well, is that fair income? And I'm telling you, that's absolutely fair income. One of my colli colleagues in Adelaide did a study on the value of the plane trees in the inner part of Adelaide in terms of saving people using sunscreens and getting skin cancers when they came out for lunch. And the money is absolutely astronomical over a hundred years. You're talking, not, not thousands, you're talking millions of dollars of savings that no one recognises in terms of the vegetation. Um, you folks would know about flooding and the value of vegetation on, on flooding. Uh, of course, it's a, it's a two-edged sword. You don't want to spread the, fl uh, the, the front by slowing the water uh, into areas where you're going to cause damage, but if you get it right, it's pretty, pretty nifty. But one of the spin-offs for this Taylor's Creek that I know about is that there is a, a sort of retention basin. The water comes down and it brings an unbelievable amount of rubbish. Now, the water spreads out, and then it gradually comes back and it leaves all the litter up on the dry land. You just go and pick it up. And I, I would imagine that people in this room would be more expert than I in knowing how expensive it is to get litter out of a river or out of a bay compared to picking it up on dry land. Another added advantage. Now, I'm, I'm going well. I wanted to finish with a couple of the social uh, and sort of economic values. And this one is interesting, and I perhaps should have, I'll put a couple of numbers to this because I haven't got any on the over I love the fact that a, a guy called Deadman, working for the Department of Health, is, is doing all of this. So thank you. And uh, you can go and see, if you go to the Victorian Department of Health and just Google Mr. Deadman, he's, he's, he's done some fantastic work. And one of the things they've, they're working on is they've looked at the Victorian health budget which you can imagine is a big worry for a state government. And they've said, if we could get 1% to 2% more Victorians recreating, either actively or passively, it would save us a lot of money. Now, let me point out that that's a big ask. Getting 1% to 2% more Victorians is not an easy thing to do. But if you did, how much money would you save? $274 million per annum. $274 million off the health budget per annum. Now, they then worked out that the simplest way of getting people to recreate is to provide them with green and leafy places to do so. It's as simple as that. And they've done a whole lot of work on this. There's, there's data from all over the world. If you're interested in this topic, go to that TreeNet website. I have a vested interest in TreeNet, I'm a member. But if you go to TreeNet.com, look up Jane Tarrant's articles. They're fantastic. And she gives great numbers of references so that you can sort of validate the information. So, what do people look for? They want trees, and they want shade, and they want them particularly in summer. And if any of you in this room are walkers, I'll guarantee that you know the walking route in summer where the shade is. You mightn't be worried about it in winter, but you'll know exactly where it is in summer. And finally, I want to talk about what are called excess deaths. And uh, again, I think this is quite slightly macabre, um, and, and you can have a bit of a sense of humour about this. I reckon an excess death is great as long as you're not one of them. <laughs> and, um, and, and my interest in this topic is increasing as I get older, uh, as you'll see, and you'll see why. During the heat wave of 2009, 374 Melburnians died. You know 172 died in the fire, right? But 374 died from the heat wave. Okay? Now, there were also people who died in regional towns, but they're working on Melbourne data here at Monash. And what they find is, if you're in a very large city, the death rate is more or less a straight line, agreed? Because there's so many people. And when you have a heat wave, there's a spike. And that spike, the number in that spike is referred to as excess deaths. And this is work that's done by Nigel Tapper and which this Mr. Deadman has taken a great interest in. And what they found 
uh, in Melbourne, for example, is that most of the excess deaths were of people uh, above 65 years of age, most over 75 years of age, most in the northern and western suburbs. Many of the people who died had come as non-English speaking migrants back in the post-war days and they often lived alone in un-air uh, un conditioned houses or in houses where they didn't have the money to run the air conditioners. Okay, so they've, they've got a very good demographic. So then they plotted on aerial maps where people died. And the thing that leapt out at them was the lack of trees and the lack of green space. And then Mr. Deadman said, well, hang on, we could use this as a predictive tool. We could look at an aerial map and say, there are no trees there. We would expect a spike in deaths during a heat wave. And if we get them, then we can do something about it. Like what? Try and persuade councils and others to plant trees. More open space. And what happens if we don't get deaths? Well, we ought to have a look at the demographic. Because there has to be another explanation, you see. So, they looked at some places where there are no trees in Melbourne. And some of them happen to be very, very wealthy and expensive new inner city developments. And there are no trees. And of course, nobody died because the people in those places are quite young. And they had air conditioning running. How much was the air conditioning running? 24-7 for at least seven days, and in some houses up to 10. The houses were unlivable if they couldn't operate the air conditioners, right? Now, they can afford to, because nearly all of them are young people, two incomes. Move forward 25 years. They're now in the 65 plus group. They're single income or no income, and they can't run the air conditioners in houses that you can't live in. What do you do? What do you do? And so the Department of Health is now saying there is a major issue here. We have to look at the health benefits. Uh, I'm not going to go through those others. I'm just going to conclude now by saying I find it fascinating that at a time when there, are, there is more data and information on the value of urban trees, and it's not just urban trees that have value, I'm not suggesting that for a minute. They are being lost. And again, there are some really quite Monty Python-esque aspects to this. Two weeks ago, I went to a block of land in Turak. Why is the land so valuable in Turak? There must be a whole lot of reasons, but one of them is it's a green and leafy suburb. Well, it's not going to be. I went to a block that's going to be redeveloped and there isn't a tree on it. Every tree gone, okay? I went to another block where every tree but four on the boundary has been cleared and those four the owner wants to remove. Not because they're problematic, but because they don't want them there. They want a blank slate to build a house, okay? And if you think about that happening, you look at the street and you see that block, that block, that block, you can go to parts of Malvern that were green and leafy 20 years ago. They're not now. They're not now. And so I find it really quite weird that at a time when the data is coming in that says, you've got to think logically about this, we're losing some of these great assets. And the last thing I'm going to tell you is you can use this information at a personal level. For various reasons, on our gar in our garden at home, we have a pine tree. It was a Christmas tree once. I've got three kids and Sandra's sitting here. So you now know why I've got the tree, right? And it's near my, it was near my next door neighbour's property and she loathed that pine tree. It dropped needles into her gutters and it blocked them and it really did. And so I said to her one day, look, you don't like the tree because it blocks up all the gutters. And she said, yes. And I said, so instead of having to have your gutters cleared once a year, you have to have them cleared twice a year. She said, yes. And at the time, because she's, she's departed now, that was going to cost her 25 bucks extra a year. And I said to her, so would it be fair if I paid the extra 25 bucks? And she said, well, you know, we're neighbours, we don't do that sort of thing. 
And, you know, and I said, well, that, that's right. I said, I'm not actually offering to pay the $25. I'm just sort of having the discussion with you. And she said, why? And I said, well, if I gave you the $25, I think I should be entitled to charge you for the shade that my pine tree provides. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, have a look at your block. In the afternoon, not one tree on the block, no shade on her house at all. And she had an air conditioner the size of a Kenworth truck sitting on the roof, right? Now, my tree shaded three quarters of her house from that afternoon sun, and she wasn't running the air conditioning. Now, as a matter of interest, in the Gardening Australia magazine in September, I did a little bit of a study that said, if you've got a tree that shades your house, this is how much money you'll save from an air conditioner. And let me tell you, she would have been seriously out of pocket. Seriously out of pocket. A minimum of 80 bucks out and up to 200 bucks of value she's getting from my tree. And interestingly enough, we never talked about the pine again after I pointed out that benefit. Now, I'm hoping she saw the benefits of the tree and she saw the light of the value of trees in your urban area. I'll leave it there, but I'm happy to answer any questions.